Major funding for NJTV News is provided in part by the members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together. And Orsted, committed to the creation of a new long-term, sustainable, clean energy future for New Jersey. This is NJTV News. Anchoring tonight is Brianna Venosi. Good evening. Welcome to NJTV News. Thank you for joining us. I'm Brianna Venosi. It appears our vigilance is paying off. Seven weeks after Governor Murphy issued the mandatory stay-at-home order, the curve of our coronavirus outbreak is plateauing. Governor Murphy says we've avoided the worst of it, for now, the statewide total of confirmed coronavirus cases hit more than 130,000 today. That's with another 2,494 positive cases added. New Jersey's total fatalities have now reached more than 8,200 with 334 new COVID-related deaths cited today. There is still a suspected lag in the reporting due to that system-wide outage over the weekend. The state is also reporting a small spike in the number of hospitalizations since Sunday, but take a look at this chart. There's 3,000 fewer hospitalized patients over the last three weeks. At just over 5,300, it's the lowest the rate's been in a month. The curve is still moving in the right direction across the state with one full week of declining critical care patients and ventilator use also down. And now there are two new efforts in the aid to this fight. Thousands more recent medical graduates will join the ranks thanks to temporary emergency licenses. The state's also been given more flexibility in its use of that federal funding from the CARES Act. That'll keep teachers, first responders, and other essential workers on the payroll. But Governor Murphy says we're far from out of the woods, both financially and in our move to reopen, whether we like it or not. So with all due respect on Memorial Day weekend, on I'm sorry about schools being remote for the rest of the years, particularly the high school seniors and their parents. I'm sorry we can't give you more definitive guidance yet on things that we're working on. By the way, non-essential retail, I hear morning, noon, and night. I appreciate all that. I appreciate all the inputs and the wisdom on beaches. We still have people getting sick, going to the hospital, and sadly, over 300 today, we're reporting in a minute, have died. So with all due respect, this is the fight of our lives. Nobody is itching more to get this state back up and running than yours truly and the team up here. But we got to do it right. The spread of this virus has devastated New Jersey's long-term care centers. In fact, today Governor Murphy called it the state's toughest challenge during this outbreak, with half of all COVID-19 deaths now attributed to residents at those facilities. It's leading to an expanded criminal investigation into what went wrong and who needs to be held accountable. Senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan has the story. We go to the facility, we wave to them through the window. Anthony Waklowski's mom and dad both live at Sunrise of Bridgewater, a long-term care facility with 14 COVID-19 cases and one death. He hasn't seen his dad, who has dementia, in weeks. He's very confused. He thinks we left him there. You know, he called, my mother calls and said, we have to talk to dad. He doesn't understand why nobody sees him. Wachowski and other families around New Jersey want universal testing of all residents and staff at about 600 long-term care facilities in New Jersey, where 509 have reported outbreaks and more than 4,000 have died. Because remember, the, the, the people got sick in these nursing homes after being locked down for a few weeks. It came from the outside. It came from asymptomatic caregivers. Governor Murphy, in his daily briefing, acknowledged the tragic statistics. Roughly about half of all of our COVID-19 deaths statewide have been of individuals who had been within the long-term care system. And just as tragically, we have seen some in the industry be slow to respond and adapt to the emergent threat of COVID-19, and we, had, we intend to hold folks accountable. New Jersey's Attorney General today announced a new online portal where people can report problems at New Jersey's long-term care facilities to provide evidence for an industry-wide investigation launched in mid-April. If they cut corners, if they, or for anyone for that matter, ignored red flags or warnings, if they lied to regulators or others, if they put profits over patients. We want to be as thorough as possible in this endeavor. 
Meanwhile, State Health Commissioner Judy Persichelli said the state will partner with several health care facilities to test 10,000 residents and 20,000 staff at 74 long-term care facilities over the next two weeks. In addition, New Jersey's Department of Health will phase in testing at long-term care centers based on the number of COVID cases at each facility. Four phases. The fewer the cases, the sooner the center gets tested. We're prioritizing facilities with fewer cases so immediate action can be taken to increase infection control protocols to further prevent spread and ultimately save lives. It's a really a crisis now, um, I think, of AIDS getting in, providing basic services. Geriatric expert Dr. David Burrill has predicted New Jersey could lose perhaps a third of its long-term care patients to COVID-19. He's been urging Governor Murphy to mobilize New Jersey's National Guard to help perform basic care. Burrill says many frail elderly patients isolated in their rooms can't even feed themselves without help. We have less AIDS now. The nurses are out sick, the aides are out sick, and people simply aren't getting fed. Francesca Veen's grandmother's at Andover Subacute, New Jersey's largest long-term care facility, where at least 15 bodies piled up in a makeshift morgue Easter weekend. Andover's been investigated and cited. I want them to care. Care about your residents. Care about your staff. Get them what they need. I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJTV News. Governor Murphy's decision to close schools for the remainder of the academic year may not have been a surprise, but it certainly dashed hopes for the thousands of students and families hoping to celebrate milestone moments and raises more questions about how educators will move forward with remote learning gaps. So what will our education system look like post-pandemic? Michael Hill reports. Verona High School senior Ryan Hughes stopped wrestling with the thought of a prom weeks ago. I've taken that out of my thought process entirely, so it's not as much of a disappointment anymore. When the governor canceled in-person school the rest of the academic year, it put in-person proms and graduation ceremonies in jeopardy. Rather not be like virtual as most things happen recently, but yeah, I'd rather it be as real as it can be for us. The governor's decision is the right decision. The right decision for health reasons, says the president of the New Jersey Association of School Administrators, Dr. Scott Rocco. Rocco is also the superintendent of Hamilton Schools with a student population of nearly 12,000, 900 of them seniors wondering about prom, awards day, and graduation. So we're looking at possibilities of virtual graduations, drive-in graduations. So I'm committed to making sure that we do something to recognize and celebrate them in as healthy a way as possible. Rocco says Hamilton brought in a Seton Hall University expert to enhance professional development for teachers, to hone in on assessing students and giving grades. He says his district quickly transitioned to remote learning and closed the technology gap. He says when schools shut down, 83% of his students had a computer and internet access. It's now at 98%. We have to look at it as an opportunity to be able to transition to a much more modern system of education. Rocco may need to apply that lesson to September. He says he's planning for a traditional school opening that would include hiring two professionals to help students socially and emotionally. But at the same time, I've got a plan for what happens if the governor says we're not ready. I think the pandemic has caused a seismic shift in how we look at K-12 education. Catherine Gallagher is a deputy assistant commissioner with the New Jersey Department of Education. She's helping districts brainstorm. And really rethinking our educational models as they've existed previously to envision something different, uh, build in flexibilities so that schools are able to bring students back physically when they can. That may not be all students, right? That may be some students at some times, and others continuing with virtual instruction. There won't be a one-size-fits-all approach. That's what Senator Teresa Ruiz says about social distancing come September. Ruiz chairs a 21-member Senate Education Recovery Task Force. She sees it as an opportunity to guide the Education Department and to address disparities in public education. Social-emotional learning. Um, 
academic learning loss. Academic learning loss is a real thing that black and brown communities have been faced with because of our public school systems. But now everyone's talking about the importance of academic learning loss. And about what comes next after the governor's keep the schools closed order. Michael Hill, NJTV News. Two new predictive models used by the White House project a sharp rise in coronavirus-related deaths as states begin to reopen. One projection from the University of Washington doubles its previous estimate, while another from the Trump administration obtained by the New York Times estimates up to 3,000 daily deaths in the U.S. by June 1st. Given that, how do we balance our actions moving forward? We asked Montclair State epidemiologist Stephanie Silvera. Stephanie, neither of these reports paint a very rosy picture. What's your take on the ground? So my take is that those reports are accurate. Right now, we have a situation where we flatten the curve, which means we have kept our hospitals from being overloaded, but we still have no natural immunity. This is still a novel virus, which means that the minute we start opening up, we will see an increase in the number of cases. We don't have any natural immunity and we don't have any vaccines available. There were a couple of reports, Stephanie, since you bring that up, that said that essentially we'll need the entire American population to have 60, 60 to 70 percent of the American population to either have immunity or have been infected before we see the stop of this spread. So that's a pretty standard number for what we call herd immunity, the idea that if a number of people are immune, we can reduce the amount of um, infection. So the number of people any one person can infect. The problem with the idea of herd immunity in a situation like this is twofold. One, we don't have a vaccine, which would mean we would need people to get sick. Um, and having people get sick means we have, you know, to get to 70%, you're talking about 200 million Americans who would need to be infected, um, which would probably, we, even with conservative estimates for mortality, mean about 2 million people dying. Does that mean then as we ease restrictions that the worst is still yet to come as some have said? I would suspect that yes, the worst is probably still yet, yet to come if we ease these restrictions and not just in terms of deaths. Um, this virus is showing about a 25% hospitalization rate. So in New Jersey, we've got about 18 or 19,000 um, hospital beds. If we take away restrictions in New Jersey, we would max out our hospital beds within a month. And right now we're already at capacity for ICU. So our intensive care unit beds are already maxed out. There's just no more room for people to get sick. And that's not just with COVID, that's anybody who would need an ICU bed. What do you anticipate for how long this virus will take to spread? There's a lot of different predictions out there, a year, two years, what's your take? So if we're, if our goal is 70% immunity, um, at the current rate of spread, we're looking to max, we're looking to get to that number sometime in late 2021. Um, now, obviously that changes if a vaccine is produced um, and there are three that are in different phases of clinical trials. Most of them are in the safety phase, which is phase one. Um, so that could move us up a little bit further and that research is being done, I think as quickly as can be done, but the reality is we can't rush the science. We're, we're talking about people's lives. We have flattened the curve though. What would be the next step after that? So I would say we flatten the curve and in New Jersey, um, our replication rate is below one now, which is wonderful. Um, I think the next step is to really keep an eye on those ICU beds and bring the capacity, um, get better capacity in that aspect so that we have more of those beds available and then you know, we can slowly think about reopening in different ways. I think particularly over the summer, having the parks open is important, but I also think it's very important for people not to get complacent and think that because the parks are open, we don't need to socially distance and we don't need to continue wearing the masks. Governor Murphy would be happy to hear that. Stephanie Silvera, thank you so much. Always great to get your insight. Thank you so much for having me. By all accounts, though, the longer our economy stays shut, the harder our recovery will be. And it's not just our New Jersey families struggling to pay the bills, but the towns we live in, too. And the cost to keep our police, teachers, and other essential services going, well, they're stacking up. Senior correspondent David Cruz reports on a dire request for help from cash-strapped municipalities. 
Like all of us, cities and towns have bills to pay, and when their income gets cut, paying the bills becomes difficult and often impossible. But cities and towns are us, our neighbors. They are the cops, firefighters, and DPW workers. As municipalities see their incomes dwindling and their expenditures growing in this global pandemic, the economic noose is beginning to tighten. We are a transitional aid city, so we receive a significant amount of assistance from the state. I mean, it's almost equivalent to receiving, when we were children, allowances. So Patterson still gets an allowance to the tune of $30 million annually. Andre Sea was among a handful of New Jersey mayors who joined Senator Bob Menendez on a conference call this morning to swap stories about challenges they're facing to keep the doors open and the lights on, sometimes literally. Their challenges are, are pretty enormous. They're losing revenues of every sort, whether it's the tax revenue, whether it's hotel uh, taxes, construction uh, permit fees, uh, a whole across the spectrum. Menendez and Republican Bill Cassidy of Louisiana will introduce a bill that will create a $500 billion fund to help states and local governments continue to respond to the COVID-19 crisis and still provide essential services. The reality is, is that uh, we didn't ask to lose nearly 8,000 of our fellow citizens. We didn't ask for over 130, 40, 50,000 infections. Uh, we'd be happy not to be in this position. Uh, the reality is that this, this disease doesn't know party affiliation, ethnicity, race, or income. It's a tall ask, especially from a Democrat who's been critical of a president with a long memory, who's already shown a lack of willingness to throw especially blue states a lifeline, even when their leaders come hat in hand, as Governor Murphy did last week. The financial assistance we need, and we need a significant amount, this is a big hit, and this is somewhere in New Jersey alone could be 20 to 30 billion dollars. But this is to allow us to keep firefighters, teachers, police, EMS on the payroll, serving the communities in their hour of need. And that's something that um, we feel strongly about. We don't see it as a bailout. We, we see this as a partnership. I will say that's a tough question because you're talking about the states and whether you call it a bailout or a lot of money, and that's a, a lot of it's for years long before you were there. Cities like Hoboken have already announced layoffs. Patterson is finalizing a plan for furloughs. And officials in Jersey City and Newark have also begun discussions about cutbacks. With cities hoping to restart their economy slowly, it's becoming increasingly clear that the state's municipalities and their residents should start preparing for some very strong economic medicine in the months ahead. For NJTV News, I'm David Cruz. And on Thursday, join Governor Phil Murphy and senior correspondent David Cruz live for a computer side chat. They'll be taking and answering your coronavirus questions. Email the questions ahead of time using news at njtvnews.org with the subject line question for Governor Murphy. Or just ask your questions live on the NJTV News YouTube stream at 6.30 p.m. Civil rights advocates want to see more medically vulnerable inmates released from federal prison during this outbreak. The ACLU and two New Jersey attorneys filed a federal class action petition seeking their immediate temporary release from the correctional institution at Fort Dix in Burlington County. Following reports that 40 inmates there tested positive for COVID-19 in the last three weeks. According to the complaint, there are 3,000 people at the prison living in units with up to 300 inmates. Inmates. Experts have warned the virus can spread rapidly among this population in those conditions. Well, we've got two new jobs reports out this week, and economists say they may capture the full damage caused by the coronavirus so far. Rhonda Schaffler has a preview plus the day's top business stories. Hey, Rhonda. Brianna, get ready to hear some tough numbers about job losses in COVID-19. Later this week, we'll get two reports that look at how many jobs were lost in the U.S. in the month of April when much of the economy was shut down. One of those reports will come from Roseland-based ADP. Economists are expecting there could be a total of 20 million jobs lost in that month alone. Meantime, the unemployment rate in New Jersey is likely to quickly surpass the levels we saw during the Great Recession, according to Nicole Rodriguez of New Jersey Policy Perspective. We do believe that this is uh, the total numbers made so far um, will soon surpass the total claims made during the Great Recession. In fact, as of 
last week, we are at 83% of the total claims made during the Great Recession. And if you look at the recession before that, um, we've doubled that. Meantime, state workers are bracing for possible furloughs. State Senate President Steve Sweeney says he's got a plan to furlough 100,000 public workers, and he wants to move forward with that plan. He told the Star-Ledger editorial board he does not yet have Governor Murphy's support for it, but the governor has indicated there could be some tough decisions ahead when it comes to state worker layoffs. Meantime, an assembly committee has approved legislation designed to help the state's smaller hospitality companies. A bill approved yesterday would allow them to obtain loans from the NJEDA. Another bill that won approval from the Appropriations Committee would help cocktail bar owners. NJ Spotlight's Colleen O'Day tells us about what's being called the Martini Bill. For the typical bar, which maybe does a lot of business with you know, martinis or um, sangria, other kind of cocktails, they really have nothing that has allowed them to be open. So this would allow folks to either go and pick up your favorite drink or have it, yes, delivered to your house. Elsewhere, some good news for our Garden State farmers. Agricultural businesses are now able to apply for a certain SBA loan. The application process began today. Turning to Wall Street, stock of Pfizer gained ground on word it's begun human testing of a coronavirus vaccine candidate. Here's a look at the rest of the trading day. I'm Rhonda Schapler, and those are your top business stories. Support for the Business Report is provided by the New Jersey Society of CPAs, equipping and empowering New Jersey's accounting and finance professionals to thrive in their careers. Learn more at njcpa.org. Even as the situation improves inside our hospitals, Republican State Senator Anthony Bucco is introducing a pair of bills to help with the second coronavirus crisis looming for our health care workers. The psychological trauma caused by working long hours, separated from family, while confronting so much death and suffering. As Joanna Gagas reports, one New Jersey hospital that's been at the center of this outbreak is also hoping to help workers cope with COVID. There was absolutely no release and no end to this, it seemed. Every day was scarier and scarier. Stressful is an understatement. There was truly sometimes, some days that I felt despair. Dr. Svetlana Zakarchenko is an emergency room physician at Hackensack University Medical Center, one of the hardest hit hospitals in the coronavirus response. Our physicians and our, our frontline clinical providers are seeing patients who are dying alone. We were counting body bags and, and making sure that we had adequate space in our morgues. As hospitals become the front lines in the war against COVID, doctors and nurses have been the soldiers on the battlefield, attacking an enemy they'd never seen before. And like any battle-weary soldier, the impact of these experiences can be devastating and long-lasting. We could be seeing a significant amount of, of post-traumatic stress disorder in our frontline care providers. Um, also, uh, research coming out of, of Wuhan um, showing up to 70% of their frontline providers uh, showing symptoms of, of depression, a, a high number of, of people showing anxiety as well. She said after the SARS outbreak in Singapore in 2003, many frontline health care providers there experienced PTSD. Now that the first wave of this pandemic has crested, healthcare systems like Hackensack Meridian Health anticipate the same response from their frontline workers. So they're putting mental health supports in place. We have created a 24-7 support line um, that is actually manned by our behavioral health team. We've also started something that we're calling coping with COVID. It might be a group of nurses or a group of physicians or one particular unit, perhaps uh, an emergency department staff or a COVID ICU staff who comes together virtually. Um, this is facilitated by a trained behavioral health provider um, and they may uh, talk about how to to become more resilient how to get through this together we organized group meetings with our colleagues where we had a professional present during the time and she was able to address from a very professional standpoint all of the fears and the guilt that we were experiencing I myself benefited so much from these original group sessions that I've set up sessions myself with her individually, which was 
truly a, a, an amazing experience. She worked through feelings of guilt over not ever being able to do enough for her patients who were dying alone, for her three and five-year-old boys at home, or for her husband who was also battling a very severe case of COVID-19. He's now healthy and she's learning to cope with what she can't control. It's like day and night. I, I At this moment, especially with the professional help that we've gotten and how guided we have been in our hospital, I feel we're personally very lucky and very thankful to the response. By all accounts, there will be a second wave of this pandemic hitting in the fall. We're going to need these doctors and nurses operating at their peak, making these mental health services so critical right now. In Edison, I'm Joanna Gagas and JTV News. And that's our broadcast tonight. Head over to njtvnews.org where we'll continue to keep you updated. I'm Brianna Venozzi for the entire team. Thank you for being here. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years. PSE&G, we make things work for communities. And Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. Look at these kids. How are you? What do you see? I see myself. I became an ESL teacher to give my students what I wanted when I came to this country. The opportunity to learn, to dream, to achieve, a chance to belong and to be an American. My name is Julia Toriani Crompton and I'm proud to be an NJEA member. Thank you.